Good morning. Welcome to the service today. We're so glad you can be with us. Um, let us bow for prayer. Father, we're thankful that we can gather together in the house of the Lord to sing praises uh, to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Father, we pray that uh, you might let the sun shine in our hearts and shine through our lives, that others might see Jesus and desire to know him whose life eternal. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be able to set aside those things which Satan would use to distract us from the blessings that you have prepared for us today from the word of God and through the songs. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to focus on Jesus and to bring him glory and that we might appreciate afresh and anew your love for us and the sacrifice that was made for us on Calvary's cross and the uh, great blessing of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives that gives us the grace uh, to walk in your uh, pleasure in the light of your word. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've uh, imputed the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us and that by his righteousness you have made us worthy to come into your very presence today. Bless us, we pray, for we are a needy people in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Andrew Locke will come and lead us in our hymns. Good morning. Please stand with me as we sing Joy in Serving Jesus. There is joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. Joy that fills the heart with praises every hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. Joy that throbs within my heart every moment, every hour as I draw. joy, joy, joy that never shall depart. There is joy in serving Jesus as I walk alone with God. Tis the joy of Christ my Savior who the path of suffering trod. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy Please be seated. <coughs> Next, we'll sing In the Service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh, so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the 
the King. I am happy, oh so happy. Through the sunshine and the shadow I can sing. In the service of the King. In the service of the King. Every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service. In the service of the King, I am happy, oh so happy. To His guiding hand forever I will cling. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy. All that I possess to Him I gladly bring. In the service of the King, in the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. Indeed, it is a joy and a pleasure and a privilege uh, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the ministry of the Word of God. And there's so many different ways that we can serve the Lord uh, in the ministry, and we're going to talk about some of those today. And so we trust that you'll have an open heart and ask the Lord what He would have you to do. We are glad that you can be with us uh, today, and we want to welcome those who are uh, visiting us via the internet, and uh, glad that you can uh, join with us as well. Again, we want to thank everyone for their uh, ministry of giving. Uh, we have been able to keep up with paying all of our bills. We are still a little behind in our budget. Uh, so if, if you've not given since COVID has started, we'd encourage you to uh, do so because uh, we, we do want to finish the year in the black. You can do so online. Uh, there's a secure web link on the church website to the far top right hand corner of the website. Uh, has the same security as a bank has uh, for that purpose. Uh, tonight, uh, we will have our evening service, and then uh, on Wednesday night, the teens begin at 6.30, Bible study and prayer time in the, this auditorium for everyone else, uh, and then on uh, Wednesday night at 8.30, uh, also we have a trustees meeting. And then on Friday nights, our RU uh, Recovery Ministry has resumed, and so we ask you to pray for that. And uh, we do have some literature on the table to the left as you go out the auditorium. Uh, if you want to invite people to that ministry, uh, there's also information on the church website that you can use uh, to invite people to that ministry uh, as well. Uh, it is nomination season. Uh, we encourage you to uh, follow the directions. It is important to follow those directions. Uh, we don't want to have to get into the problem that the government has right now with determining which ballots are good and which ballots are not, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so please follow those directions on the nomination forms. Um, and again, you must ask permission to place someone's name on that nomination form. I've asked uh, Kevin Donaldson, uh, I don't know if Bobby's joining him, but I've asked Kevin to come this morning and share a challenge with you regarding the upcoming Honduras trip. It's coming very quickly. Um, we're scheduled to leave the day after Christmas uh, with Jacqueline and Sophia going with us. Um, we're as far as what we'll be doing, it's slowly taking shape. It's a little different than what we had planned before because then we were going to be working at a, a number of days at the camp, but that's not going to be happening now. But I know at least what I'm going to be doing because I have auto parts arriving to my house that I have to take down. So I know I'm doing brakes on a Volkswagen Beetle, <laughs> working on a Tacoma pickup truck. So um, I'm getting my work there. And we're also going to be doing some special music in uh, churches, probably some outreach even with the hurricane flooding. I don't know if you've been seeing the news, but they're going to take a direct hit by this next one. It should be a Category 2 hurricane when it makes landfall uh, tomorrow or Tuesday. They're anticipating, they're already, uh, San Pedro Sula sits in the level ground. It's uh, Chiquita Bananas. That's their headquarters. So it's all flat banana plantations and it's mountains around it. So all the mountains drain right to where they are. And so they've been really flooded. 
Uh, Conover's house is higher land, so they haven't, but a number of their churches, if you saw any of the videos and the connections with, uh, with their prayer letter, severe flooding. And they're, so, they're saying already that they're going to get 20 to 30 inches of rain from this next one. So it, it could be really devastating. But they've been able to have an outreach of, of cleaning up these churches, of going into schools, uh, openings that they've had. So there's a chance we'll be participating in that as well. Um, you can just pray for their safety through this next hurricane. Also, as far as traveling for us, a prayer request is we have to have a, a COVID test within 72 hours of arriving at the airport there. Um, that's already hard to do, but it's going to be over Christmas. So just pray that we can get that coordinated and organized so that um, we can travel even and get there. And we just thank you for your prayers and your support through it all. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we are over two-thirds or three-quarters of the money uh, has been donated for that ministry. Again, you can give online uh, to that. Uh, one of the options there says, uh, I believe, Honduras trip, uh, or you can place money in the offerings for that purpose as well. Um, and then also uh, going to be much in prayer, as Kevin mentioned. Now, he said 20 to 30 inches. Now, he mentioned he mentioned the mountains. So 20 and 30 inches raining in uh, uh, uh where, where Sam is uh, uh, means that that could be five, six feet uh, because it's going to come down from the mountains. So that 20 inches plus what they get is going to add up pretty bad. So I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures that we've uh, shared with you and linked on, on, or if you're on for if you're on Sam's Facebook page, he's been showing pictures as well. Uh, so uh, we don't want to be, we do want to be much in prayer for them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Uh, Father, we do commit the Conover family and uh, the churches uh, in Honduras uh, into your care. We do ask, Lord, that you would uh, continue to bless their ministry uh, as they have uh, used this uh, uh, natural disaster uh, for a positive way to reach into the community uh, by showing Christian love and sharing the gospel by also providing uh, help with the things that they can help with food and furniture and, and all kind of things of that nature. We do pray that you would keep them all safe, Lord. We pray that you'd provide the money for the trip for our team to go down uh, and also the money that's needed down there uh, for relief as well. We do pray, Father, that you would uh, work out these uh, COVID tests as Kevin mentioned, uh, because it's uh, Christmas and uh, it's going to be a very tight window, but you can work all that out. And we commit that to your care even now, Lord, that uh, the four uh, people going might be able to be tested and those tests would come back negative so that they can uh, con continue to complete the trip. We also pray, Lord, that uh, the nation would not close again as it did before and that our nation. We also pray, Lord, for the uh, situation here in Delaware County. Uh, we know that uh, the cases are increasing, um, and uh, we ask, Lord, that you would help everyone to be careful, uh, monitor, and uh, keep the proper distances. Uh, we do pray for those who have uh, contacted the COVID, Lord. We ask that you would strengthen their bodies. We pray that you would give the health care workers. We have a number of health care workers uh, related to our, in our church and related to our church, Lord. We ask that you would keep them all safe and give them strength, Lord. This is a lot of emotional as well as physical battles. And so we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them and encourage them. Lord, we do pray for the families in our church that are or connected with our church that are going through uh, very trying times regarding uh, the illnesses of loved ones. Uh, we think of uh, Byron Brooks. We think of Joyce Santan, Sarah Eccleston, Joyce Massey, uh, Holly Rambo, uh, Pastor Craig Griffith, Muriel Bradley, uh, John Orndorff, uh, uh, and others, Lord. We just ask that you would lay your healing hands upon them. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, touch them as the great physician. Uh, we pray for their doctors, that they would have compassion uh, and wisdom to minister to them, as well as the nursing staff and the support staff, Lord. Uh, we're, we want to thank you, Lord, for the safe and healthy delivery of Aaron and Kendall Gagne's baby, Lord. We give you the glory and praise for that. We pray that you would help Kendall now recover from giving birth, and uh, we pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe. Uh, we do pray, Father, for uh, additional 
ladies in our families that are expecting. We think of uh, Joe and Lindsay Reisinger in Uganda. We think of uh, Kevin and Amanda DeBello uh, here in Delaware County. Lord, we ask that you would give them healthy deliveries and healthy children. Uh, we do pray, Father, for our ministry in our community. And help us, Lord, to be able to reach into our community. Help us, Lord, be able to love them and share the gospel with them. And may you be glorified in all that is done in our church ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, Andrew will come and lead us in a hymn that you may not be familiar with, but it's really not hard. It's entitled Faithful Men. Jesus giving all in the race, pressing upward to gain the heavenly prize. Faithful men are my witness who have struggled and died, and they watch from that grandstand in the skies. Faithful men have gone before us, faithful men who fight and stand. I want to follow in their footsteps. Jacob joined with the faithful, Joseph followed behind, Moses ran with the mighty men of old. There were David and Daniel, then came Peter and Paul, now they chant as they run on streets of gold. Faithful men have gone before us, faithful men who fight and stand, I want to follow their footsteps, guided by those faithful men. Now we will sing Vessels for the Master Use. Vessels for the Master's Use. Please stand. Please be seated. At this time, Andrew will come and sing us a, give us a blessing in music. When disappointments of my life surround and cause my heart to fear what lies before. Within God's word my trembling spirit hides. I learn to trust his wisdom more and more. God's word my guide, my leadership within. Ordain my steps to follow in your way. Return me once again to walk by faith and rest within your truth from day to day. I may not understand God's ways for me, but this I know, his word will never fail. And when life's trials seem too hard to hear, I know that through it all God will prevail. God's word, my guide, my leadership within. 
ordain my steps to follow in your way. Return me once again to walk by faith and rest within your truth from day to day. God's word illumines every step I take. Securely it surrounds me in his love. With comfort brightens feeble paths of fear, reminding me of better things above. God's word, my guide, my leadership within. Ordain my steps to follow in your way. Return me once again to walk by faith and rest within your truth from day to day. God's word, my guide, my leadership within. Ordain my steps to follow in your way. Return me once again to walk by faith and rest within your truth from day to day and rest within your truth from day to day. Thank you very much, Andrew, Alexandra. We're going to be looking at several different passages this morning, Lord willing. Um, the clock is a little slow, I'm thankful. Uh, most, most of you didn't get it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Father, we're thankful for the Word of God. Lord, we believe that the Bible is authoritative. We believe that it tells us what we need to know regarding church ministries, regarding our families, regarding our nation, regarding our lives. We pray, Lord, that we would live out the creed of Baptists who believe in biblical authority. And we pray, Father, that we would be submissive to Your Word and would be ever faithful in trying to diligently apply its truths to our lives today, that You might be glorified in all that is said and done and no one particular person but Jesus Christ who has the preeminence. In His name we pray. Amen. Our subject this morning is choosing spiritual leaders. There are many passages in the Scripture that address that issue. The basic theme or big idea is that the election of church officers is a matter of prayer and evaluation. It is a matter of prayer and evaluation. It is that time of the year when our church family needs to prayerfully consider whom the Lord would have us have served among us as leaders. Some people will serve one year. Some people will serve three years. And if we get enough people on one ballot, some people will serve two years. Nomination forms have been emailed to the church members and some have been uh, mailed via the postal service. And again, we encourage you to pre please read the instructions on the nomination form and follow those instructions. And I do remind you, you must receive permission to place someone's name on that nomination form. Now, our membership is around 160. Our constituency is well over 250. Now, I say that because only about four people make nominations. So about four people every year make nominations. So we encourage you to get involved in this process. 
we encourage you to prayerfully go before the Lord regarding this issue. So the first point I'd like to share with you this morning is the Bible teaches that the election of new church officers is a matter of prayer. Turn to Luke chapter 6. The Gospel according to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We will be turning to several passages this morning. In Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 12, And it came to pass in those days that he, referring to Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him the disciples. And of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. A disciple is one who follows the teaching of a leader, of a rabbi in this particular time. An apostle is one who's appointed to represent that leader. And Jesus here set a good example for us when he prayed all night prior to selecting the 12 apostles. He, as the God-man, wanted to make sure that he communicated with God the Father to know God the Father's will regarding the selection of these 12 men who would have a special role in his ministry and then a special role in his ministry after he was crucified, rose again, and ascended unto heaven. And so if Jesus spent all night in prayer about selecting 12 men to be as a possible, certainly that is a, an example for us that we need to spend time in prayer for selecting deacons and deaconesses and uh, other officers of the church. I'd like you to turn now to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We won't spend a lot of time here because we actually spent an entire message last year on this. But in Acts chapter 13, verses beginning at verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so here we find another example. This time the example of the church in Antioch that fasted and prayed about selecting spiritual leaders, specifically missionaries, to go forth and represent the church in Antioch. This decision was so important that the church leaders at Antioch skipped meals to spend time in prayer together. That's what it means to fast. To fast is to skip a meal to spend time in prayer. I know there's a lot of wacky stuff on the internet about fasting, but if you read the Bible, you'll find that it's skipping meals to pray that particular time. Also, turn back to Acts chapter 6. That We were just in Acts 13. Now Acts chapter 6, and actually this is the passage that we looked at in great detail last year. Acts chapter 6. Since I didn't put the notes in my passage in my notes, I should turn there as well. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected to the daily ministration then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is, not, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among yourselves, men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and uh, Prochorus, and uh, Nicanor, and Timnon, and uh, Parmenius, and uh, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. There are several observations that we can make from this passage. Um, first of all, I want you to understand from verse 2, it says, 
The twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now these men, the word deacon in various forms is all through this particular passage. Um, some people like to argue that they're, they're not actually deacons, but the word deacon in one form or another uh, as an adjective or as a verb or uh, is in this passage is woven very through. They're just translated differently uh, in those cases. But I want you to see clearly that the word serve, which actually means to do the work of a deacon, the word serve tables is what they were emphasizing. And so these men were to serve tables specifically they were to provide the daily needs of the widows who did not have family members who could care for them. The word uh, dikoneo, uh, the verb, it means to serve, to minister, or to deacon. The nature of this ministry is described in verse 1 as ministering to the needs of the widows in the daily ministration. It was kind of like a church meals on wheels to help the widows who did not have family members that could take care of them. Now I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, the gospel according to Mark chapter 10. In this passage, we'll find that Jesus teaches us the importance of serving other people. In Mark chapter 10, verse 41, and when the 10 heard it, now what the background of this is James um, and, and John and their mother had gone to Jesus and asked for special uh, recognition to be above the rest of the ten. So that's the background of the context. And when the ten heard it, they be began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know, he's talking about the twelve now, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whosoever of you desires to be first shall be slave or servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so we see here that Jesus himself teaches by example and by word the importance of serving others. To follow Jesus means to follow him as a servant leader. To follow Jesus means to follow him with a servant's heart. I trust that you have a servant's heart. And we are very thankful for everyone who's actively involved in the various ministries of our church family. A person who follows Jesus will minister to others by serving them. We can elect as, as many as five deacons in January. We have excellent deacons, but I'm sure that some of the older men would like to have a break. And we need younger men to serve the Lord as deacons. If we can get five men, then th three of them will serve a three-year term, and two of them will serve a two-year term. We need younger men to serve the Lord as deacons. So, men, I would challenge you to seek the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord if this is something He would have you to do. Jesus demonstrated the importance of serving others. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. The passage we just left said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. One of the problems in many churches is that there are people who want to be served and not serve. I'm so thankful that we have a very large number of people who are willing to serve the Lord in various ministries in our church. In John chapter 13, beginning in verse 2, the Word of God says, And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose up from supper and laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. You see, it was customary in their time because they wore sandals 
that when you entered into a house, a servant would come, you would, you would sit down, you would take your sandals off, or the servant would take your sandals off, and the servant would wash your feet so that you could then enter into the house. This is something that a rabbi would never even consider doing. This is something that the head of the household usually would never do if they had servants in that house. And yet Jesus here is trying to set an example for the twelve and for us that every servant leader must be willing to humble himself and take upon him the form of a servant and be, if necessary, wash the feet of others. When I was in high school, I needed to live with my grandparents on my mother's side of the family at night to take care of them to make sure that they didn't fall out of bed and break a bone or something or, or other things. And one of my privileges was to wash my grandfather's feet. You see, he was a stroke victim. And they were up in age, and my grandmother was up in age, and you know it would be hard for her to do that. And one of the nice things about my grandfather was the stroke didn't affect his feet too well. So he was very ticklish. And I had the joy of having some fun with him uh, by tickling his feet whenever I washed them. But it was an honor. And we all need to be willing to do whatever the Lord wants us to do to serve Him. We should not simply sit by the sidelines. And I'm reminded of when there's no COVID around, the illustration that talks about these football stadiums that some of them hold maybe as many as 30, 40, or 50,000 people who are in desperately need of exercising, watching 22 men on the field who are in desperate need of rest. You see, we are in a spectator society. And God wants us not to be spectators, but to be participants. God wants us to be servant leaders. God wants us to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ who humbled Himself and washed the feet of His disciples. It is a humbling thing to serve the Lord as a servant, whether it's as a deacon or a deaconess or a Sunday school teacher, or an Awana leader, or a church treasurer, or assistant treasurer, or church secretary, um, or Sunday school superintendent, assistant superintendent. You know, we have a big list of needs. So ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? I doubt if you'll hear the voice like Samuel heard, but you may feel the Lord tugging on your heart. You may feel that, Lord, with that impression in your heart and your mind saying, you know, are you willing to get involved in the ministry? Back in Acts chapter 6, there are spiritual qualifications regarding the deacons in particular. In Acts chapter 6, uh, we find in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look out among yourselves seven men, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Regarding deacons, they were to be men. The Greek word in this passage is the gender-specific word for men, not women. It is interesting to note that the word brethren, adephos, is the generic word for man that may include both men and women. So the Brethren had an opportunity to vote on this issue of choosing these seven men. You'll notice also it tells us that they needed to be men of honest report. Why? Because they were be, they would be given they were given a budget with which to procure food for the necess, for the necessity of the deacons who did not have family to provide for them at that time. And so they needed to be men of honest report. They were spiritual leaders who had a good testimony in the community as well as in the church itself. They were men full of the Holy Spirit. They were spiritual men who walked with God. They were full as opposed to empty. Spirit-filled people are obedient to the Word of God. Spirit-filled people do things God's way, not their way. Spirit-filled people are controlled by the Spirit, not their emotions or self-will. James Dobson wrote a book that uh, is a good book to read from some time if you haven't read it. It's called Emotions, Can You Trust Them? Because our emotions can be very misleading in our lives. We need to live based on the 
filling of the Holy Spirit, not, not on our emotions. We are emotional people. God made us to be emotional people. But those emotions need to be surrendered to the Spirit of the living God. You probably have met empty Christians pretending to be spiritual when they're not. Christians who are not full of the Holy Spirit are like a bell that rings hollow. How can we tell if a person is spirit-filled? Well, the best way that I know is to look in the Word of God. And the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and following, what the fruit of the Spirit represents. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness or gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. See, there's those emotions, the passions, the desires. He says, those who are spirit-filled have crucified the flesh to those passions, to those emotions, to those desires. To focus on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. Against such there is no law. And so the best way to determine if a person is spirit-filled is do they evidence the fruit of the Spirit as a dominating factor in their life? He continues, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. They were men also who were full of wisdom. You know, wisdom comes by experience. It's not simply intellectual knowledge. Uh, you could memorize the Bible and not have wisdom if you don't allow it to change your insides, to change your life, to change your perspective on things. They were full of, of, of Sophia, wisdom. This implies that they had knowledge of the Scriptures as well as knowledge of life experiences. And I want you to notice in verse 5 and 7 that doing things God's way brings a blessing. He says, And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose, and then listed the men they chose. Then look at verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. It pleased the whole multitude. In other words, doing things God's way brings unity to a church congregation. The word of God increased, verse 7. The gospel spread throughout the community. The Word of God spread. And it says the number of disciples multiplied. People got saved because there was unity in the church and they were doing things God's way. But there's also objective qualifications. I got in trouble, I think, one time uh, when, I was pre when I was candidating at a church many years ago. Uh, they asked me about this passage. I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy. I don't think they liked my answer, but I still stick with my answer. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 uh, through the chapter, it gives the biblical, and listen carefully, objective qualifications for a pastor and for deacons, for spiritual leaders. These are objective qualifications. These are things that are not subjective, but must be found in the president, in the presence, in the life of a, a pastoral candidate, a pastor, and a deacon. And ver we'll look for today's, because we're looking in church officers, uh, deacons and deaconesses and others, we'll look at verse 8 and following. Likewise, must the deacon be grave, not de double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, lest they, uh, le then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacon be the husband of one wife, ruling his children and their own houses well. For they have, have uh, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
The first thing I want you to notice is the in verse 8, the words deacons is plural. And then I want you to look at verse 1. This is a faithful saying or a true faith saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, singular or plural? Singular. There is a lot going on throughout the world regarding the plurality of elders. And, but God says here, one, uno. And then in deacons, plural. Now you can have a plurality of elders. The Bible's certainly not opposed to that, but it is not required. And a biblical observation, if you look at all the passages, the pastor, the deacon, and the elder are one in the same. Those words are used interchangeably. And so here we have the didactic or the instructive portion of the Word of God telling us how to choose pastors and deacons. And it tells us you only have to have one pastor, but you need many deacons. Why? Because the deacons come alongside of the pastor to serve with him. They are essentially his primary source of assistance in the ministry to minister to the church as a whole. And it gives us uh, seven different qualifications. And depending on how you look at it, you might get more, but I'll explain as we go through. It tells us, first of all, in verse 8, the Likewise, must the deacon be grave. Now, you'll notice that the word must is in italics, which means it's not in the Greek text, but it is certainly legitimate and necessary for the proper translation because it looks like it looks all the way back to verse 1 and 2. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work, and a bishop then must be blameless. In the Greek language, as referred to as a day, delta, epsilon, yoda, of moral necessity. This is not something God says, I am recommending to the church. These are not recommended qualifications. These are God's required qualifications for pastors and for deacons. These are not optional. God says it must be such such a way. And so, because he says likewise in verse 8, it looks all the way back to what God required of the pastor, referred to in this passage as a bishop. And so the first thing that he tells us in verse 8 is that the deacons must be grave. I know, you've seen a lot of people you thought were walking dead. That is not what it's talking about, okay? It is not what it's talking about. It means honorable. It means worthy of respect. One, uh, well, in the English language, Webster defines grave as having a serious and dignified quality or demeanor. A person who is, now it doesn't mean they can't have fun, okay? Don't misunderstand that. It doesn't mean that they have to be funless type people. No, they have to be dignified people. They have to be have a, have, have a serious side to them when it comes to spiritual issues and to doing their service for the Lord and to the church well. Uh, there are many different translations of this word, but I think uh, what we've given you is, uh, is sufficient. Secondly, he tells us in verse 8, not only is the de- are the deacons to be grave or worthy of honor, but they are not to be double-tongued. Now, there are different ways to say not in the Greek language. This one is emphatic. This one is a strong adversative. This one is telling us that you really have to take this serious, that the person who is going to be a spiritual leader cannot be double-tongued. Thayer's Greek lexicon defines this this way saying one thing with one person and another with another with the intent to deceive. So a double-tongued person says one thing to one person and something different with another person with the intent to deceive. James Swanson, another writer of a, a Greek lexicon, says to be hypocritical, insincere, two-faced, speaking with forked tongue. And so a deacon or a spiritual leader must basically tell the truth. 
they must be trustworthy when it comes to things of that nature. We also find not given to wine or much wine. And again, it's a strong adversative. There are many different translations uh, of this, actually 10 different ways it's translated. Uh, once Tyndall said, not given unto much drinking. Uh, Geneva, King James, and several others say not given to much wine. Uh, the New American Standard and ESV and others say not addicted to much wine. Um, the NIV uh, group of translations say not including, not indulging in much wine. Others say they must not drink too much. Others say they must not be heavy drinkers. One says not drinking a lot of wine and, and etc. There's a reason it says much. You see, Biblical wines at this time, and we've given a sermon on this, and there's plenty of literature available to support this. Wine could either be pure grape juice or it could be very alcoholic. And so what he says is, if you know, you don't know which one it is sometimes when you're drinking it. So don't drink much because if it's got the alcoholic side to it, you're going to get drunk. And he says, don't drink much wine. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Holy, verse 18, the Holy Spirit said, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So focus on spiritual things, not this. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29, he says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of the eyes? And then he answers, those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. What he's just described there is a way for them to ascertain when it had become alcoholic. So when it has certain characteristics, stop using it is essentially what he says. And then he tells us why. At the last, it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies at the top of a mast, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake, that I may seek another drink? And so what he says is, is be careful. Avoid this. I believe there's plenty of evidence that Christians don't need to drink alcohol at all. Because Bible wine and modern wine are not even the same classification, if you'll be honest with the evidence and look at it, and we can provide you with that. But now, notice what the fourth characteristic or requirement is for spiritual leaders. He says, not greedy of filthy Lucre, not seeking gain by base means, translated Darby, not found of sordid gain, translates the New American Standard. The New King James says, not greedy of money, not greedy of gain. The, the English Standard Version says, not greedy of dishonest gain. The NIV translation say, not pursuing dishonest gain. Well, God tells us in his word other things about this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is an Arabic word which means riches or wealth. Now he's not saying, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying, he's not saying that you can't be a wealthy person. That is not what he's saying. But what he is saying is, what is the focal point of your life? There are many wealthy persons who, who uh, are, are historically there have been, and I'm sure there still are, but historically there have been many wealthy persons who ch achieve wealth, guess what? So they could give more to God. Letourneau lived off something like 5 or 10% of his income. He gave away 90 or 95% of his wealth for the kingdom of God and the furtherance of the gospel. You can find the same true, same thing true of J.C. Penney. You can find the same thing of John Wanamaker. 
These men were very successful and very wealthy, but they were not seeking it for greedy purposes. They were seeking it for the kingdom of God. So, so he's not saying you can't be wealthy. He's not saying you can't drive a nice car or anything like that. But where's the heart in all this issue? Where is the heart? Is it to show off? Is it to have people look at you and, and focus on you? Or is it to be the furtherance of the kingdom of God? Look at verse 9. We have our fifth characteristic, our qualification. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Simply put, that basically means this person needs to have assurance that they're born again. This person can't be doubting one day whether they're saved or, or not saved. You can't have spiritual leaders who aren't 100% sure that if they were to die, they're going to go to heaven. Because they've got to be sharing the gospel with other people and ministering to them. And so they need to, to have that confidence. Paul wrote later in this particular uh, epistle in chapter 5, verse 22, he says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. The King James says, Lay hands on no man suddenly nor share in other person's sins, keep yourself pure. In other words, you don't grab a, a, a new uh, convert and make them a spiritual leader. Well, several years ago, that actually happened on a national level. And people were flocking for that person's leadership and that person's books. And that person has since left his wife and his family and gone into great wickedness. You see, you can't lay hands suddenly. A person must be proved. Which brings us to our next point. Look at verse 10. And let these also first be proved, lest, excuse me, let them first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. I like, uh, there's a lot of different ways this is translated. I like the translation Johannes Lund and Eugene Nida give in their lexicon. They translate this this way. They should be tested first, and then, if they prove blameless, they should be they should serve as deacons. They should be tested first, and then, if they prove blameless, they should serve as deacons. Let them be proved. Let them be tested. This is a command. It's an imperative. It means to test, to examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not. To, to, uh, to recognize as genuine after examination. If you have a gold ring and you're not sure whether it's really gold, you would take it to a jeweler and he would assay it. That's what this word is. He would put it through an acid test or something and determine what it actually is and what it's actually made of. And so... For ministry purposes, as far as pastors are concerned, that's why, as a general rule, they go through what is called an ordination council. They are uh, asked a whole lot of hard questions to determine their knowledge of the Word of God and how they handle themselves under pressure and under stress. That is part of that proving process. In a local church, uh, we don't do that with deacons or spiritual leaders to that extent. We do want them to have basic understanding of the Word of God and be able to handle the Word of God and, and be uh, found fundamentally uh, solid in their faith and not uh, denying the precious Word of God. But one of the other ways is we, we, we prove them by examining their life. You don't grab a person who's just joined the church and make them a deacon or a deaconess or a Sunday school teacher or an Awana leader. You need to have time to get to know that person and to find out more about that person. My family and I, uh, it's our tradition when we're on vacation that we go to church Sunday morning on the Lord's Day. And one time we we're coming back and uh, we had no idea, so we kind of just looked through the phone book at that time. This was long before cell phones. And we got there and it happened to be a certain type of a Baptist church and during the service, the pastor announces, I want everybody who is ordained to the ministry to come forward. We're going to lay hands on this man. I told my wife, I said, I am not going forward. I don't know this man from the man in the moon. I am not laying my hands on him to give my sign of approval on a person that I do not know and have never met in my life. And therefore, I did not go. 
and would not go if that opportunity arrived again. They are to be found blameless. King James at the end of the passage says, being found blameless. They are to be proved, and and the result of that proving, that testing, is that they are to be blameless. It's an adjective which describes the desired result of let them be proved, let them be tested, let them be examined. It means cannot be called into an account unaccused. I had a teenager ask me many, many years ago, Pastor, this is when we had a church van, Pastor Dan, why do you never take me home last? I said, have you never noticed that I never take one person home last? I always take the kids who are multiple in a family, two or three together in a family home last. Why? I didn't want any false accusations being made. I didn't want anybody being able to say, oh, when I was alone with Pastor Dan, this is what he did. No, I took certain precautions. When I have certain people in my office, the door is open so people can walk back and forth or the door is ajar so there can be no false accusations. Being found blameless means to be without reproach. Blameless. It does not mean sinless, by the way. Okay? We are all sinners saved by grace. And I, and I feel that in some cases that may be why some people say, well, I can't serve because... I'm not the perfect Christian. There is no such person as the perfect Christian. We are all sinners saved by grace. But we can have a good testimony for the most part. We can have that which shows more than our occasional sin, though we sin every day, one respect or another. Lowe and Nidia say this, pertaining to one who cannot be accused of anything wrong. Swanson says, free from accusation. And so if then they've been examined, they've been tested, and they've been found blameless, he says, then let them use the office of a deacon. The King James says, let them use the office of a deacon. It means that they can serve in an official capacity representing the church. They should be tested first. Then, if they prove blameless, they should serve as deacons. It seems quite evident, uh, writes Lou, that uh, uh, this word involved a number of different functions as persons served others, especially in connection with relief to the poor. And in some instances, it may be best to translate this word to have responsibility to help others or to be responsible to take care of the needs of believers. And so, a deacon is not someone who sits like senators and House of Representative people in Washington and legislate law. A deacon is a person who works with the pastors to serve in the ministry. And so we look for people with servants' hearts. And then the final of the seven, the way I've organized them, focuses on the home life. Look at verse 12. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. First, the deacon must be faithful to his wife. He cannot be divorced. Oh, Pastor Dan, that means a one-woman man. Yes, it does. But there is no other way in the Greek language that I know of to say that he has to be the husband of one wife. And as a matter of fact, if you will turn over to chapter 5, verse 9, I want to show you a very interesting piece of grammar. He says, Let not a widow be taken into number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. My friends, that is exactly the same Greek construction as the verse we're looking at, except for it's talking about a woman. Verses. And it's clear in that passage that, you know, she's to be the, the, the wife of one man. And so it, the implication, and Paul tells in other places, clearly that if she's of marriable age, she should remarry. And so that the deacons, so that the, those who come under the ministry of uh, being providing for them are those that don't have family members who can provide. So 
So not only must the deacon be faithful to his wife and cannot be divorced, as well as the pastors, by the way, the deacon must rule or manage their children well. Now, I, I prefer the word manage, and so do most of the translations, modern translations. It doesn't mean to rule with a rod of iron. It doesn't mean to slap them upside the head every time they make a mistake or, or do something wrong. It, it, it takes into consideration from Proverbs, train up a child in way in which he will go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It means to manage that child in a loving, parental way. And so pastors and deacons are to ro- rule or manage their children in a loving way, or as he describes here, well. And then he says, and manage their houses, their own houses. Uh, I, again, some of the newer translations use the word household, and I think that's better because what he's talking about is many of these people, not all of them, but many of these people had servants who lived in their households. They had employees who were part of their household. They had businesses. So what he's telling us is that they need to be able to manage their domestic affairs well. They need to be able to manage their domestic affairs well. Why? Because if they can't manage their domestic affairs well, how are they going to be able to manage, to manage a budget that provides for the widows in the context of what's going on in these passages. So all persons forming one family form a household. It could be cousins. It could be brothers-in-laws or sisters-in-laws who live there. It could be servants. It could be hired employees. It could be the property or possessions associated with a house or a household, right, Swanson? And so... When looking for spiritual leaders, God says they need to have a servant's heart. God says we need to spend time in prayer about it. Not just find a warm body. Not just find any, oh, dude would do, so to speak, or any person. But a person with a servant's heart after much prayer seeking the Lord's guidance. And then we must evaluate that person in light of these objective qualifications that God has given us. Men and women, because we're talking about more than deacons, who are filled with the Spirit of God. Men and women who evidence the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And so my challenge to you today, if you're not serving in one of these capacities, and again, I want to thank everyone who does serve the Lord in multiple capacities throughout our church, But will you follow Jesus as a servant leader? Will you follow Jesus as one who has a servant heart? Will you follow Jesus as one who is willing to help the people of your church family? And if you're not a member of our church, we encourage you to join with us if you're born again, if you're walking in obedience to the Lord, to join with us to get involved in this wonderful ministry of ministering and reaching our community, of raising boys and girls in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to walk in fellowship with God and to minister to those. And regarding hospitality issues, we have a lot of wonderful people with the gift of hospitality in this church who they don't come to me and say, Pastor, can I go do this? They just do it because they have a servant's heart, because they have a love for their brothers and sisters in the Lord and for the people in their community. Father, I'm so thankful, Lord, for our church family. But Lord, we do need more people to get involved in leadership roles. And we pray that you would lay the burden on the hearts of some to pick up the mantle, so to speak. We pray that all of us would pray about this We pray, Lord, that we would be willing to scrutinize one another in a loving way, not a judgmental negative way, to determine if a person is qualified. And so, Lord, we commit this time unto you the next few weeks as we consider nominations for our 2021 year that you would raise up servant leaders with servants' hearts 
to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. This time Andrew will come and lead us in our closing hymn. Please stand with me, and we'll sing, Give of Your Best to the Master. Give of your best to the Master, give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example, dauntless was he young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion, give him the best that you have. Give of your best of the Master, give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, Join in the battle for truth. Give of your best to the Master. Give him first place in your heart. Give him first place in your service. Consecrate every part. Given to you shall be given. God his beloved Son gave. Gratefully seeking to serve him, give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master, give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. Give of the best to the master. Naught else is worthy his love. He gave himself for your ransom. Lay down his life without murmur, you from sin's ruin to save. Give him your heart's adoration. Give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the man. Give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time we've had in your word today, and we pray that as we have begun our nomination season that you would help us to do this prayerfully and help us to consider uh, those who would be uh, right for, for certain offices. We thank you for so many that, that do serve and, and are serving now, and Lord, as we prayerfully consider. We pray that you would guide us, that you would uh, raise up uh, more uh, men for these offices and, and, and women for the, the, the roles of, of deaconess and other other uh, uh, offices that are on the ballot. We pray that you would raise up leaders who would uh, bring honor to you and be willing to serve humbly and help us all to be willing to take stock in, in ways where we can uh, serve you more each and every day and guide us in that process. Help us not to run ahead of you, but also help us not to lag behind if you're leading any one of us in any certain area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.